Motorsport TV Live, brought to you by Motorsport Tickets, the dedicated motorsport experiences provider. Hello and welcome to Motorsport TV Live. I'm Chris McCarthy. Coming up today... We'll be looking back at some of the key situations of the Formula One season and casting an eye over the role of the race director moving forward. We'll have insight from Autosport's technical editor, Jake Boxall-Legg, and we'll also take a look at what the future might hold for sprint races in 2022. That's all coming up right here on Motorsport TV Live. So as the dust begins to settle on what was a historic, action-packed and at times controversial Formula One season, we're starting to take a look back at some of the bigger contributing factors that added to the drama. As I mentioned at the top of the show, I'm pleased to say I'm joined in the studio by the technical editor of Autosport, Jake Boxall-Leg. Jake, thank you very, very much for joining us here in the studio. Let's get into some of those controversial moments. I think before we took a, a look at some of the moments in particular, let's talk about Michael Massey, race director, how he did as a whole throughout the season. I think it's been you know, a tough role to settle into. He had such big shoes to fill at the start of 2019 when Charlie Whiting obviously passed away and he had to take up the mantle of race director. It was something that he'd sort of done before as well. He'd done it for Aussie supercars, and, but moving to F1, that's a, a big challenge. Um, and, and some of what he's done has been very, very good. I think he's, rather than go for a single precedent on some instance, he's sort of taken it within the context of what's happened, what track they're at, that kind of thing. That's kind of, I think, why the controversial Brazil turn four instant mm. was judged as such, because, you know, there was runoff. It had it been gravel, it might have been something different, for example. But there have been several other aspects as well, like the end of the season finale, um, that probably haven't gone quite so well. Um, one of the things that the FIA are perhaps looking at is giving him a little bit more support in the role next year, which I think is good. I think, you know, trying to, you know, sack him or something like that, that's, it's, it's probably way too early because, you know, he can grow into this role. Um, it's something that Charlie Whiting did for many years and he had a good support network behind him um, and Michael Massey hasn't done so much. So I think it's a sort of wider issue, for example. Yeah, I think let's uh, take a look. Saudi Arabia, I think we got some footage of that now from what exactly happened uh, in there. So, uh, of course, that was a, a, another moment as well. Here we can see Abu Dhabi, of course, that was the safety car. You can see the lapped cars behind Lewis Hamilton at that point. They were then way through and uh, a lap later there we see Max Verstappen going through on the final lap. You know, it, no matter what he did throughout the season, whether he did a fantastic job or not, he's, he's going to be always remembered even 20 years down the line <laughs> for that moment, isn't he? I think it's part of the exposure as well. This is something that Charlie Whiting never had to deal with. It's this added media attention that you now get when you have the FIA to team radio that we've started to get this season. And we're seeing how, you know, he does you know, deals with the teams, but, you know, works with them to try and find a resolution, that kind of thing. And sometimes it can be a bit comical, but now we sort of hear the teams lobbying him as well. And, you know, when you've got two teams fighting for a championship, you can end up with like a deer caught in the headlights, for example. Um, and, and whatever decision you take, it's not going to be the right one for some people. So, you know, I think there's always room for improvement for sure. Um, but, you know, I think, as I said at the top, it's a very, very difficult job. He's come under fire. The team side, say, have come under fire for lobbying him, haven't mm. they, as such? And a lot of big names within the industry saying that needs to stop. It, does it need to stop altogether? I mean, I think the fact that they're now being broadcast has kind of egged the teams to do it a little bit more and you know, choose their words a little bit more carefully. But, you know, do you, do you think that needs to stop or does it just need to change? Do, for example, does he need someone else they speak to through Michael Massey, almost like a, a fourth official, if you like, like it's used in football? Or, or a receptionist or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Michael's not here right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think, no, I think that's a, a, a good solution. Um, but I do think that it should just be nominated members of the team that are only able to speak to him so you can't have team principals doing right. it, you know, 
that should be the case with the sporting directors. Mercedes has Ron Meadows, uh, Red Bull has Jonathan Wheatley, for example, and they should be the only ones. But I think you can take it a step further and say teams can't go to them with it. I think the FIA can only you know speak to you when you're spoken to, really, and that should be the end of it, really. But I, I do see why there is this sort of added element of these messages being broadcast. I mean, it's kind of for the show, isn't it? Mm. Uh, just before we move on, the FIA have backed him, you know, since Abu Dhabi. They are planning to bring in the DTM race director, Niels Wittich, to kind of support him next year. So it's unlikely, although a lot of reports suggested he was he was going to be facing the sack. That's very unlikely. So, so what needs to change next year, do you think, for Michael Massey to, you know, to, to take off the criticism? I think the FIA as a whole needs to work on setting what is the precedent and judging everything by that. Um, there isn't much consistency and we've seen that over the last couple of years. Decisions that can be taken for one circuit, for example, uh, Kimi Raikkonen being penalised in Imola for not passing all of the other cars, you know, when he was when he was lapped and asked to pass the safety car and he didn't comply with that regard uh, and he was he was given a penalty for it and then you get to the finale and not all of the cars are being moved past the safety car so there isn't consistency and nobody knows what the rules of engagement are and that is something that needs to be made clear off the bat for next season because then you're going to end up with all of these grey areas and if you know if you've got a good enough lawyer um, you can swing the wording of the sporting regulations in your favour and potentially get you know get off scot free. Yeah, it says something you know that even Helmut Marco said you know the whole system needs to be rethought after Abu Dhabi after they, they became champions as well. Bernie Eccleston just called him a race director that was simply <laughs> overwhelmed. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of changes over the winter. Uh, we could talk about that all day though. We don't have you for too long, so let's move on. Uh, you are a technical editor, so <laughs> I'm going to ask you about flexi wings, one of your favourite right. subjects. So, uh, well, where do we start with that? Of course, Paul Ricard, I think, was one of the times where we first saw it coming in. Yeah, just tell us w what flexi wings was all about, because just a lot of people, they're just two words put together and they don't really know exactly <laughs> anything else about it. Well, flexi wings have been part of Formula One for years now, and it's all about you know making you know your rear wings or your front wings flex so that you know maybe on the front wing it's closer to the ground, so you're generating more of a ground effect and getting more downforce, or you're tilting it back to reduce the drag, for example. And that's usually what you get with the rear wing as well. You're trying to tilt the wing back, or you're trying to shape it in some way that at speed it's producing less drag, and so you get more top speed. Um, and it's something that teams have been doing for years. Um, but every time teams do them, it, you know, it gets banned in some way or another. So the teams have to box a little bit more clever. Um, and this year, you know, Mercedes felt that Red Bull was tilting its wing back at speed. This sort of came to a, a head at the Spanish Grand Prix, uh, where Lewis Hamilton said that Red Bull, you know, has this bendy wing and the can mm. of worms was opened. Mm. And a number of other teams were saying, yeah, we're still doing flexi wings, by the way. Um, and as you said, at the French Grand Prix, they introduced more strict tests to ensure that you know during the testing they sort of pull back the wing to make sure it doesn't sort of move back too much uh, and they tighten that up but then you ended up with an interesting situation later in the year where Red Bull thought that Mercedes had a flexing wing um, and Christian Horner said that there were like scuff marks on the back of the rear wing um, what they said that they were doing was you have the main plane which is like the bottom plane of the rear wing and they said that it was at the sort of trailing edge the back piece was tilting back to cut the drag again um, but you know the rhetoric was sort of one of a conspiracy theorist if you like there wasn't hard proof and there was a video that circulated on social media but it didn't really show anything so the jury's still out on whether they had a flexing wing or not um, it's something that Formula One teams have done forever will continue to do in some way or another so you know give it another four or five years and we'll be talking about this again I'm so sure. despite the big changes before we move on despite the big changes it's going to be something we see next year even with the new cars or potentially um if teams are clever enough they'll find a way to do it um i mean all wings flex to some extent or otherwise they just snap but um it's it's how you make that legal and 
derive a performance advantage from it. There's always something, isn't there? I remember Mercedes had the, the thing on their steering wheel, didn't they? Which yeah. supposedly made them faster. So yeah, there's always something. I, I'm interested to see what it is <laughs> next year. Okay, so tracks. We, we introduced some new ones this year. Uh, Zandvoort, which for me had probably one of the best atmospheres of the season. Uh, I've been to Zandvoort. I didn't know how they were going to get all the fans in there, but they squeezed them in. Qatar tyre blowouts was kind of the story there. Jeddah, well, you know, <laughs> Jeddah was Jeddah. That's all I can say about that. Uh, I thought it was a fantastic race there. What were your views on, on the tracks? Do you think they worked? Do you think it's good that they're going to be coming back? Uh, I think for the most part Zandvoort worked. I think the banked corners was very much an experiment, but it was one that I really liked. Um, I think I did a feature after that race actually saying which other tracks could have banked corners, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a sort of uh, an overall bonus. Um, I think the rest of the circuit is very, very difficult to overtake there because it's so narrow. Um, but in the atmosphere as well, all of those Max fans sort of packed in at close proximity. Um, it was great for Formula One, I think. And the race was okay um, as well. Again, you know, it's just symptomatic of, you know, the historical legacy of the track. Um, it's always been difficult to pass that and it will continue to do so. But you have those banked corners now. There are different lines. You have sort of variable banking as well. So that the sort of time delta between taking the low line, taking the high line, for example, it you know, it should be about the same, but it kind of depends on what nick your tyres are. Um, so there's lots of opportunities there. Qatar was fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, the problem with Qatar is it's a bike circuit. It's flat, yes. it's long radius corners. It's not ever meant to be for Formula One. Uh, and it was never designed as such as well. I think the biggest single seater race that had there previously was uh, GP2 yeah. Asia. Yeah. Um, and we, we won't be going back there next year because obviously the the world cup in qatar uh, it might be on the cards for 2023 but qatar is looking at creating a new all-purpose circuit for formula one so it seems that even they don't back you know the la Salle circuit to do the job long term and then jeddah um funnily enough i was uh, away for that race i was at my mate's wedding and i came back and i watched it on the tuesday and it was just yeah. completely crazy and again this is another area that's going to have uh, 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 an all-purpose circuit sort of later down the line that's been designed by Alex Burke, for example. But, you know, for the time being, we've got the core niche circuit and it needs changes. It needs changes. It's just, it's, it feels gratuitously dangerous just for the sake of being challenging, almost. Mm -hmm. um, you have all these high-speed blind corners and it's just accidents waiting to happen. Um, and I think we saw that over the weekend. So. Mixed, mixed reviews, I think. Yeah, it's mixed like, reviews. It's like Monaco on steroids, wasn't it? It yeah, was absolutely exactly. crazy. Um, let's uh, a quick word on Spa then, because weather played a big part throughout the season. Yeah, Lando Norris, that heartbreaking moment in Sochi. <laughs> uh, but of course, Spa, where the weather played a huge moment uh, in the season. We had that two lap procession behind the safety car after, I don't know, six to eight hours. I uh, mm. don't know how the commentators filled all that. <laughs> uh, there it is. Uh, and the fans, of course, were absolutely drenched. Uh, what did you make of that? This goes back to Michael Massey again. What, what do you think of, of how that race was handled? Should it have just been canned altogether? Or? I think it, it's so difficult because you cannot predict the weather. It is complete force majeure. And when you end up in a situation like that, there's only so much you can do um, and obviously in hindsight you could have said well it wasn't raining so much earlier in the day they managed to get a formula 3 race going so you know why not do it then but you of course you don't know that you think that maybe by the race time has started by the time we get to two o'clock local time that things might have cleared up and things were supposed to clear up and there were sort of pockets of you know radar where there wasn't going to be so much rain and then suddenly it just the deluge continued so it's really hard to say and I think one of the other criticisms leveled at it, at it as well was why couldn't they just do the race on a Monday um, which I think it's difficult because it's not like US racing it's not like NASCAR where it's a washout and you can go again on the Monday because the marshals and everybody involved are employed by the tracks it's not really like that in European racing you know mm. everyone's a volunteer and they're doing it just because they want to be there and so on Monday, they've got jobs and things to do, and so do the fans. So it, you, you can't just get a race in on a Monday. Um, it's really hard to pick what was the right solution because, you know, it was so unpredictable on the day and everyone was just taking it minute by minute.
Yeah. Well, it was like similar to Abu Dhabi. Mike, Michael Massey wanted some sort of a race, uh, and, and that was what we got. It was two laps, but uh, but there we go. Uh, let's talk about sprint, sprint races then. Of, of course, we had three this year. Uh, people did not like the idea of it going into the season, but I think it grew on it certainly grew on me throughout the year. What, what did you make of the sprint races? I think Brazil was by far the strongest one and mm. that was helped by Lewis Hamilton coming from the back and sort of burning his way through the field but I, I think for the most part it usually set up quite a good Sunday and the sprint races weren't massively interested in, interesting in themselves because the drivers didn't want to risk too much because there's only a maximum of three points on offer so what it ended up doing is yeah setting up Sunday to be quite interesting um, we had that at Silverstone we had that at Monza um, and Brazil was very, very good as well. Um, but there are drivers against it. You know, Sergio Perez, for example, said that drivers don't want to risk too much, so they're sort of not really totally for it unless the format changes, the context changes, whether it sets up the grid for the Sunday or whether it's a standalone thing, or whether it's a reverse grid race. Um, there's not much jeopardy at the moment. Um, Ferrari, for example, said that reverse grid races could work and Hamilton proved that in Brazil um, mm. by coming through the field. Um, the only problem with that is if you completely reverse the grid, you have all of the fast cars at the back and so they're sort of fighting amongst each other. Um, so maybe that won't be as exciting. I don't particularly know what the best way for that is. Um, we'll have more next year. We'll have six. Um, so we'll sort of see. It's still an ongoing experiment. Um, I, I, I'm still on the fence about them. I, I can sort of take them or leave them. I don't hate them, but they're okay. You mentioned the six, so Bahrain, Imola, Montreal, Red Bull Ring, Zandvoort, and Brazil were the ones on the cards. You mentioned that you know the sprint races didn't carry a lot of weight with them this year, but next year, it's you know supposedly they're going to be standalone events, so they won't affect the grid for Sunday. They'll probably carry more points with it. And Bahrain was an interesting one because they're talking about using the outer loop for the sprint race which was a you know which was a huge success i think george russell would love to try that one again <laughs> particularly so yeah what's your thoughts on you know on that being a standalone event and maybe experimenting with different layouts at, at Bahrain? i think i think that would work perfectly and that outer loop uh, circuit did work very very well in 2020 and that was almost like a sprint race in itself because it was that double header um you know, if they have more, as you say, weight, more importance and a sort of a bigger part of the weekend, then I think they can really work. It's just like we got this halfway house this year and obviously it was like a test and we sort of had to sort of do it on the fly and work it out, mm. you know, based on its merits. But, you know, Formula One's still working it out. Um, the purist is never going to be happy and they'll say, you know, Formula One shouldn't be like this. But, you know, qualifying formats have always changed, so why can't race formats? Mm. Let's, I'll tell you what, let's just pick the grids out of a hat and make them dry <laughs> run backwards. How about that? Uh, Jake, thank you very much for joining us. That's all we've got time for. Uh, I'm Chris McCarthy. Join us again here on Motorsport TV Live for more season reviews and roundup. We'll see you soon.